Hello, good, good morning, everyone. I'll briefly, by my name is Federico Fernandez. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce. This is a total innovation that we are doing in this in this conference. Uh, for for the first time, we will be recording, you know, a, a podcast episode at the conference, and not on not not any podcast, but you know, the Contra Krugman podcast by these two gentlemen who really don't need any any presentation of mine. Just a few things about the methodology as, as how this is going to, to work. Well, the Contra Krugman podcast is a podcast that now has a bi-weekly frequency and in which, you know, uh, Tom and Bob try to, you know, dissect and explain economics via, you know, the, the, the columns of Paul Krugman. I think you all know, you all know him, uh, that he publishes on the New York Times. They'll be doing their episode as if it were a normal episode. I suppose they'll mention, you know, where they are. Um, and when they finish, they will wrap up the episode as, 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 you, as usual. Then there will be some time for, for Q&A. And, you know, I, I uh, commend you, you know, to, to use that time to, to ask que good questions to these, to these gentlemen. Please, in your questions, be very, very short so everyone can, can ask. So, and by the way, uh, well, Bob is here because he was a keynote speaker, as you saw yesterday, and Tom is here because later today, and some of you will be participating there as well, he's going to be granted the 2019 Hayek Lifetime Achievement Award. So it's a very special occasion for, for all of us, and a very well-deserved uh, prize for, for Tom. So without further ado, I leave you with these two gentlemen. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you, Federico. I'm Tom Woods. This is Bob Murphy. We're just about to start the recording of our program. Before we do that, just a brief word about the nature of the program. Uh, perhaps some of you have uh, even heard it before. And it is called, indeed, Contra Krugman. The website is ContraKrugman.com. We've been doing it since, I think, 2015. And we pick a Paul Krugman column, and we use the errors in it to teach economics. Now, now and again, Krugman is correct, and we give him credit where it's due. But that, it, that's been the, the structure of the program. We choose, and it so happens, by the way, it's almost as if Krugman knew we were attending this conference, because he gave us a column about European economies. And so we're going to have a little fun talking about that one. The origin of the podcast goes back a number of years to my realization that there is somebody on this planet who knows more about Paul Krugman and his views and the evolution of those views and things he believed in 1998. There is no one on earth who knows more about this than Bob Murphy. And that includes Paul Krugman himself. <laughs> because Bob will dig up things Krugman wishes nobody remembered. Bob remembers. <laughs> And today we've got some juicy examples of just that. So what we'll do is, uh, first of all, I will summarize the column that we're talking about. Then we'll get a little banter going. But I really thought of this podcast as an opportunity for Bob to shine. I, I thought Bob should do the show on his own. I knew he was too much of a lazy bum to do it. <laughs> so I decided I would co-host it with him, so to speak. But I more or less am going to feed him stuff and give him yeah. an opportunity to shine, especially since I just won a Lifetime Achievement yeah. Award. He's, I feel he's like I done slack contributing off now. Yeah, for his I'm lifetime. I'm all finished. His, his work is over. I have nothing else, nothing else I need to do. So having said that, we're going to do what we do at the beginning of the show. We'll announce the episode number, leave a couple seconds of silence for where we will insert the really nice uh, bumper music, and then off we go. Contra Krugman, episode 211. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods, Bob Murphy here with another episode of Contra Krugman, a very special episode. Uh, we are here at the extraordinary uh, conference put on by the Austrian Economic Center here in Vienna. And our surroundings are the unlikeliest of surroundings because we are indeed, Bob, where are we right now? We are at a large table. Okay. <laughs> Let me situate that table for you. We are actually at the Central Bank here in Vienna, <laughs> which is not a, a venue I expected to be recording Contra Krugman from, but doggone it, Bob, we're, we're going places, you and I. Yes, I do want to mention, just I should have brought it up yesterday in my talk, there are actually two Austrian national banks. I don't know if any of you had that confusion. The, the 
taxi driver we took originally yesterday, you know, I had the, the address at 10 o'clock and so I was very nervous, wanted to get here on time. And the taxi driver took us to a different building and on my Google Maps, you know, it showed that there was like a little park and that where we were going had a little park and he said, here it is. And I said, but where, where's the park? You know, because there was no park in front of the building. And he said, Austrian National Bank. And he pointed at the wall and said, Austrian National Bank. And, and so I, okay, and I got out and we went into the teller, you know, front and I said, is there a conference here? And he said, no. and as I was pulling out my information, some euros fell out. And he said, ah, you want change. And I, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I do want change, but that's more like a metaphor or, you know. <laughs> and, and so, of course, for, I mean, for those of you who know, it's, it's like three blocks. I'm getting my orientation like this way. And so, fortunately, I went out in this point, point I'm in a real panic. Because what can I do if even the taxi driver doesn't know where this conference is? And some guy on the street, you know. So, so once again, like the, the people, the man on the street knows more. It's like dispersed knowledge or something. But he. He, he got us there, so I was, I was thinking that that's the one time where I wish there was a monopoly in banking, that there would only have been one. So, <laughs> but yes, we are at the Austrian National Bank, though, right now. Okay. And when you say we, you mean you and your wife. I found the place with no problem. I just want to clarify. I just walked here. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> I was trying to provide employment. <laughs> All right, well, Paul Krugman provides employment for us because his columns are like a giant make-work project for Bob and me to sit around and, and, and do unnecessary work, namely ref refuting errors we wouldn't have to refute if he hadn't uttered them in the first place. But in the column we're talking about this week, namely Centrists, Progressives, and Europhobia, the November 7th, 2019 column, uh, we begin with reference to the U.S. presidential campaign. And here I was thinking that being in Austria for a week I would get to ignore that for a while, but here it is staring me in the face. And he's making reference in particular to a woman who may in fact enjoy right now um, front runner status, and that is U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren. And he's saying, now, and by the way, my summary of his column is always a dispassionate summary. Much as I want to make editorial comment, we save that for later. So I'm simply telling you what Krugman is saying. He says that one of the things he keeps seeing critics of Elizabeth Warren saying is that her policies would, would turn America into Europe and maybe even France. <laughs> and he says, now anybody making a claim like this, I mean, you just have to wonder if people making these claims have paid any attention to Europe over the past few decades. And he says, yes, Europe does have big economic problems, but they're not the ones that these sorts of critics seem to imagine. These critics, he says, seemed to be frozen in the 1990s when we would speak of eurosclerosis. We would talk about large social spending and excessive regulation leading to a kind of economic malaise in Europe and a persistent lack of jobs. And he says, I'm going to quote this sentence, by the way, because the wording here will prove very important for, but I'm queuing up Bob for later. This is Krugman. Employers, the story went, were reluctant to expand both because of high taxes and because they feared not being able to fire workers once hired. At the same time, workers had little incentive to accept jobs because they could live off generous social programs." Unquote. And Krugman says, but this is long ago. This jobs gap has largely vanished and households in, uh, and, and uh, uh, unlike most Americans, most Europeans, oh, well, he goes on to say that this jobs pro, uh, issue is, is largely solved. And moreover, if we're going to compare GDP, well, it may be true that uh, European nations have lower GDP per capita, but that's simply because Europeans have more vacation time. And they're, they're on vacation. And so that's why their GDP may be a little lower. And that just goes to show they have, uh, they've made a decision about work-life balance. He says that life expectancy is another area where the United States has in fact fallen far behind. And he thinks this is because there's universal health care and policies mitigating extreme inequality in Europe. He says, now, there are still problems. He says the nations on the euro remain terribly vulnerable to financial crises for reasons Krugman has been talking about for a number of years. And he says also we have some European countries, yeah, which ones you think these are, that have an obsessive fear of deficits. Hmm. Uh, even when the European economy desperately needs stimulus, he says. He says so if Europe is vulnerable right now economically, 
it's because its politicians have been unwilling to be Keynesian enough. See, it's times like this that really challenge my ability to be dispassionate in giving you these summaries. I really would like to say something. But, so he says, look, anybody who's pointing to Europe now as an example of what happens when you're too progressive politically is an idiot because Europe is quite robust and has moved past that old period of stagnation. So that is more or less the column. We always link to the column on the show notes page of our episodes. So that would be, in this case, contrakrugman.com slash 211. But those of you here in the live audience, if you try to go to that page, since we haven't uploaded the episode, you will find an error. But those of you hearing the recording, you go ahead and look at the column if you so desire. So, Bob, we have lots we can talk about here. Uh, I'd like to pitch something to you, okay. and then maybe you, you go with it. What's not mentioned in the column, there's, we have mention of, of unemployment, and, and Europe is supposed to be doing very well there. But what's left out, which is a major category here, is youth unemployment. The figures on youth unemployment seem quite bleak in much of Europe. And... In fact, I saw, I saw you actually have some numbers. I didn't have the numbers. I just knew qualitatively things are bleak. Quantitatively, they're bleak, too. Yeah. Tom's the historian. I'm the economist. So he, he knows <laughs> patterns, but not numbers. Yeah, so what, again, the specific quote, again, Tom did a good job summarizing here, but I want, it's important to, to make sure you understand the logic, the rhetoric of his column. He was saying, ah, yes, these, these complaints about eurosclerosis had some validity perhaps in the 1990s, but at this point they're irrelevant. And the specific thing he says here, just to make sure you got it, is, this is I'm literally quoting from Krubina, the jobs gap has largely vanished. Adults in their prime working years are actually more likely to be employed in Europe, France included, than they are in America. So in general, that sounds like a, a kind of odd, you know, it's like sort of saying there's more people named Jacques who have a job in France than in America. That seems like a very specific thing. You'd think when you say to somebody, hey, what's the labor market like? Is it worse in, in France or in the United States? The first thing people might bring up is like the unemployment rate, you know, rather than what portion of the prime age adults have jobs. And so if you look at that, as of September 2019, the French unemployment rate was 8.4%. The U.S. unemployment rate was 3.5 percent, and then also you might say, well, maybe there's institutional differences between Europe as a whole or the economies are. Okay, remember Krugman concluded by saying Europe's not Keynesian enough. So if we want to pick, like, what's the, the the country in Europe representing austerity that's you know not nearly Keynesian enough versus France, Germany is a good example. German unemployment in September was 3.1 percent. So again, French unemployment was 8.4, German and the United States were in the, the threes. So that right there, you know, would you have known that from Krugman's column? Isn't that an interesting statistic? And then as Tom says too, so what's partly what's going on here, the reason the national unemployment rate is so much bigger in France is because Krugman picking that narrowly tailored statistic of prime age adults and, and how, do, how do they you know, compare in terms of jobs, it's excluding the youth market. So if you look at youth unemployment, just to give you an idea, so th these numbers now I'm reading are the annual average for the year 2018. In the United States, youth unemployment rate was 8.6%, okay? In Germany, it was 6.2%, okay? In France, it was 20.8%. Okay, so I know I'm an Austrian, but even I know that 20 is bigger than 8 or 6, okay? And it's a lot bigger, right? This is one place where cardinality is okay to use, okay? And then, and then also, just to show, well, maybe there's some quirk with France, Italy, you know, if we picked that and said, in the grand scheme of things, if we're going to complain about too much austerity or not Keynesian enough, and, you know, where does Italy fall? Presumably, that's more on the social welfare and, oh, my gosh, you know, we don't want U.S. politics to be like Italy, Italy's youth unemployment rate in 2018 was 32.2%. Okay, so again, the, notice that, that odd juxtaposition there and the Krugman's odd choice of statistics. So I would say he almost had to be very careful and walk a tightrope to reveal only the statistic that made his point rather than the obvious one. And again, it's not that we're the ones saying, oh, gee, Krugman's got to put, put let's, let's you know, scratch our heads and try to go find something. And I spent three hours Again, when you naturally say to someone, what is the labor market like, or do the regulations and social welfare programs lead to less employment, the first thing somebody would say is, what's the unemployment rate? And obviously, there's a huge gap in those numbers. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's get back to the column and see what, 
what the next stuff is. All right, yeah, how about this thing? Um, European nations have lower GDP per capita largely because they have a lot of vacation time. They're going on vacation. Do you think that's the explanation? I mean, that, but by the way, that's not absolutely implausible that that could have some role. Uh, what do you think about that? Sure. So, again, like theoretically speaking, and, th and this is just for those who don't follow him, this is typical of the way Krugman operates. Rarely does he say something that's just demonstrably false. Okay. And even when we sometimes find him, and, and we're going to get to this in a minute, when we find him saying one thing today that seems at odds with what he said 10 years ago, it's usually not that he, it's a literal contradiction. It's what I coined as Krugman contradictions, and I spell it with a K. Now, I realize in Germany, you might say, yeah, of course, K, it's a K, what are you talking about? But <laughs> in, in the United States, that's more of a play on Krugman's first name, but starting with a K. And so by what I mean there is it's not a literal contradiction, like he used to say A, and now he's saying not A. It's just the, the arguments he used. So for example, here, the, with the one we just went over, the fact that now, so he didn't say something wrong. I'm sure his statistic about prime age working adults, you know, having more jobs or a higher percentage, I'm sure that's a true statistic. But the, why did he pick that one and not the more obvious choice of just standard unemployment? I would say clearly it guided him one way. And we'll show later when he wanted to make the opposite claim, he, he relied on the unemployment figures. Okay. So that's what we mean by a contradiction. So likewise here, yeah, it's, it's not crazy, like theoretically it is possible that a certain country because of the culture and maybe people just, like for example, in, in a, a country that is in a tropical area and it's on the beach and there's coconut trees and whatever, you might not expect them to work as much, right? It might not be as important to them to live in big mansions and to have sports cars because, no, I just want to be outside and enjoy, you know, the beach and the amenities of this, of this natural paradise. So it wouldn't be crazy to look at the, those group of people and they maybe not work as many hours for their employer per year as people, you know, living in the tundra do. That, that, that's not a crazy suggestion. But in terms of economics, there's a way you can isolate that. So let me just make sure you understand the, the distinction. When, when, when economists call someone unemployed, that doesn't mean a person who doesn't have a job. It means a person who doesn't have a job, but who wants to have a job. That's what it means to be unemployed. So if someone is 70 years old and isn't working, if, if the person's just retired and is you know, watching TV and going on, on the Contra cruise or whatever, that, that person's not counted in the ranks of the unemployed. It's only when someone's applying for jobs and like government surveys ask, are you seeking employment? If they say yes, and then say, do you have a job? And they say no, that's what it means to be unemployed. Okay, so again, Kr Krugman is, is right theoretically that in principle, the fact that they work fewer hours in France per year could just mean, oh, that's a cultural difference, and they, they enjoy leisure more than people in the United States do, or the people in the United States have this obsession with work and they're workaholics. That may be true, but again, the way you would distinguish and say, is it merely a reflection of preferences versus something's wrong with the market, the, uh, the first thing you would look at is the unemployment rate, right? That's, that's the, the measure. If it were really just a matter of, oh, no, they just choose not to work as much because of their, where they fall in their leisure material goods trade-off and their utility curves or what have you, the way Krugman would think, you, the unemployment rate would still be the same. It's just they would work fewer hours. But yet, as I just showed, the unemployment rate, particularly among youth, is much higher. And let me also just mention... Um, it, the, the story here, the fact that, oh, there's, there's a lot of regulations in place, including things like a high minimum wage, but also, again, the, the claim being that it's hard. If you hire someone in France, it's harder to get rid of them legally than it is in the United States. And so that makes employers reluctant to hire people in the first place. You have to be really sure this job applicant is probably going to work out because if you get, once they get a job, it's, it's hard to get rid of them if, they're, if they turn out not to be productive. So if you just think through who is that going to hurt more, you know, someone who's 35 that's had 10 years of experience or someone who's 17 trying to get his first job, clearly that barrier is going to hurt the 17-year-old more because we have no information about the person. We have no, and the person has no skill, you know, few skills. Okay, so that's why the youth unemployment is such a good statistic to see wh which of these effects are, or wh which of these explanations has validity. And so that, that's the way I would answer that one. Mm, mm. All right, we got more. See, this, this is what I just sit here, and Bob, Bob just got it. He just got it in the old noodle up here. All right, again, why he got the Lifetime Achievement Award, because they realized Tom's done. He's yeah, not that's producing right. anymore. Tom's Give checked out. His life point. is over <laughs> as far as uh, academic scholarship. Well, the thing is that... <laughs> <laughs> the thing is... A lot of the topics that come up on this program, like healthcare and energy, for example, and climate, 
Bob's like a genuine expert on all those things. I mean, he's he's done a lot of work on on the economics of climate change in in various uh, forums, and he's with the Institute for Energy Research. He's he's co-authored a book on healthcare. I mean, it, so I just get used to saying, well, it's another column, another area where Bob's the expert. It's a it's a good if you can't beat him, join him. Is the philosophy <laughs> behind Contra Krugman? All right, let, let's say a little something about life expectancy. Uh, we were talking about this before. Sure. Um, is there anything that can be said? Is capitalism killing us? Sure. So, again, so the, and this is something in the, let's, for those of you from not the United States, right now, the issue of health care and health insurance is a huge issue politically. That's one of the central um, elements of the, of the campaign. Some people point out, it's funny, too, that the Democratic uh, contenders to become the presidential candidate, on the one hand, it's saying we absolutely need to solve climate change within the next 10 years or else we're all dead. And then the other thing is, and then we also need to fix health insurance, and we, you know, long to, and so it's interesting that, well, if we're all going to be dead in 10 years, why do we need a good health care system? You know, it's kind of, <laughs> but, uh, it seems kind of wasteful. Um, but, and, and, so that, and so one of the, so of course, as you can imagine, in terms of politics, the political figures are not very nuanced, and so it is true that Republicans in particular, when they oppose a Democrat proposing an expansion of government provision of health care services or now, you know, the, some like Elizabeth Warren and others proposing to get rid of private health insurance altogether. And so Republicans will say, oh, that's socialism or, you know, everyone's going to be dying. And so the obvious retort is to say, oh, but look at life expectancy in, you know, the G7 or what have you, all these other nations, every high income nation besides the U.S. has some version of universal health coverage. So this isn't some crazy totalitarian, you know, Marxist ploy. This is a standard thing. And it seems to be working, right? Because life expectancy in these richer countries is higher than it is in the United States. So there. Okay. So I, I don't want to hear, like, just be too glib and dismiss that. I think that is an important element. But there are some countervailing uh, circumstances here. So let me just give you a couple examples. There was a study in the um, JAMA, so the, I think it stands for the Journal of American Medical Association in 2016, where they looked precisely at this. So they compared the US with 12 other high income countries and the US had the lowest life expectancy you know, of the 13. It, it wasn't a huge gap, but it, you know, it was like a more than a year difference on, on average or in terms of you know, at birth, what's the life expectancy. And so then they went through, though, and looked at some of the constituents of that gap, and it turned out that just about half of them were attributable to injury. And so in particular, firearm deaths were, uh, accounted for 21% of the gap, right? So again, I'm saying the U.S. had a lower life expectancy than the 12 other high-income countries that they studied, and so now they're looking at what are the causes of that. And so 21% of the gap is explained by firearm deaths. 14% was what they call drug poisoning, and I think they, meet, they include like over, you know, what they call overdoses. And then 13% was from motor vehicle fatalities. Okay, so you add all those numbers, it's like, it'll be like 48%. So, that, of course, that doesn't mean that, oh, there's nothing wrong with the United States. I mean, that is disturbing. The, the motor vehicle death, you could just say, because the U.S. is so spread out, people spend more time driving, so it's not, and, you know, driving in a car is, is more dangerous than on a subway or a, a bus or, a, you know, a, a regular train. So there, that's, that's an obvious reason that there'd be a gap that you'd expect. The, the firearm, the drug overdose, I mean, clearly that's an issue, and perhaps U.S. policymakers should try to figure out why do we have a higher rate of those types of deaths than other countries do. But it's clearly not the fault of U.S. hospitals that if somebody gets shot, they can't bring them back. You see what I'm saying? Like, that's not the fault of capitalism, that if you get shot, you're probably going to die. Okay? And so that's, that's part. So half of these figures alone is just accounted for by those, you know, pretty obvious things. And then the other thing, too, is stuff like Americans tend to, to have a poorer diet than their European counterparts. So, for example, um, it, there was a study that came out. Now, this, the numbers were, like, were averaged over the 2000s, so there's not one particular year. But the obesity rate in France was 17%. In the U.S., it was 34%. Okay, so things like that as well, that just looking at the raw, you know, what's the life expectancy, it's, it's not entirely obvious that, oh, if there's a difference, you should attribute it just to the fact that there's private health insurance in the United States when there's a lot of these other factors. So it could be the case that the U.S. healthcare system actually does better on many things. It's just that what they're dealing with, you know, is people in poorer health when they start out. All right, let's let's get to some. Oh, wait, actually, wait. 
Which of the, uh, what topics do you want to hit with the, 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 the what do you want to, yeah. oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, oh, this is good. Now, when I summarized the column, I quoted one particular sentence that may have seemed not particularly different from any of the other sentences. But you'll, now you'll see, the key words in this sentence are, the story went. So the sentence from Krugman is, this is describing what eurosclerosis was supposed to have been like. Employers, the story went, were reluctant to expand both because of high taxes and because they feared not being able to fire workers once hired. At the same time, workers had little incentive to accept jobs because they could live off general so, uh, generous social programs. So employers, the story went, blah, 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 blah. Now, th that's an interesting choice of words, Bob, yeah. the story went. Yeah, so Why is that an interesting choice of words? So yeah, as I was showing to Tom before the show, we were conferring, when Krugman says the story went, what he means is when I taught this in all of my textbooks and the essays I wrote in the 1990s. Okay, so he's saying the story as I told it, and you know, just in my textbook that came out in 2010, was such and such, okay? So let me just document here, we're more in an academic setting, so let me read longer than I, w I would have perhaps if we were on the Contra Cruise. So let me just go through this. It, it won't be too long, but I just, I just wanna show you this isn't some one-off thing where Krugman was drunk at a cocktail party and said, ah, oh, eurosclerosis. No, this was a very documented thing. He clearly believed what, if you read this column, you would think it was something that Newt Gingrich made up or Ronald Reagan made up or Th Margaret Thatcher. And the, yeah, maybe they can, but now clearly they're wrong. No, this is what Krugman was teaching people. So from his 2010 textbook, okay, so this is from Krugman, which he co-authored with Robin Wells. The book was called Essentials of Economics, and this quote came from the 2010 version of it, or edition of it, it said, people respond to incentives. If unemployment becomes more attractive because of the unemployment benefit, some unemployed workers may no longer try to find a job or may not try to find one as quickly as they would without the benefit. Ways to get around this problem are to provide unemployment benefits only for a limited time or to require recipients to prove they're actively looking for a new job, okay? Also from his textbook, Macroeconomics, which he also co-authored with Robin Wells, here he specifically mentions Europe, right? So that last one you could say, well, that was a generic thing. Maybe he didn't have Europe in mind. This one he'll specifically measure, mention Europe. This is Krugman. Publicly pol public policy designed to help workers who lose their jobs can lead to structural unemployment as an unintended side effect. Most economically advanced countries provide benefits to laid off workers as a way to tide them over until they find a new job. In the US, these benefits typically replace only a small fraction of a worker's income and expire after 26 weeks. In other countries, particularly in Europe, benefits are more generous and last longer. The drawback to this generosity is that it reduces a worker's incentive to quickly find a new job. Generous unemployment benefits in some European countries are widely believed to be one of the main causes of eurosclerosis, the persistent high unemployment that affects a number of European countries. Okay, so again, that was from Krugman teaching in his textbook. And so notice, too, there that when Krugman's now assuring us that, oh, the problem has largely vanished, in his textbook, when he said, what's the problem, what is eurosclerosis, he didn't say there's a, there's a lower amount of prime age working adults who can find work in France versus, no, he said the unemployment rate. That was the criterion by which he showed there is possibly a trade-off, an unintended side effect, structural unemployment. So to now tell us this isn't an issue, you'd think he would point to structural unemployment, but no, as I showed you, that's still, there is a huge gap in unemployment. Let, let me read one more here. This is from June of 1997 when Krug, Krugman was writing in what's it's called Salon Magazine. Okay, so this now is a more pop essay where Krugman's gonna be a little saucy, a little, a little cheesy since we're talking about the French here. And, and so, you know, the other ones, he's more formal. It's a textbook. This is Krugman being more, you know, writing for a popular audience. So I won't read that. I'll, just, I'll summarize some of this. Krugman says, to an Anglo-Saxon economist, France's current problems do not seem particularly mysterious. Jobs in France are like apartments in New York City. Those who provide them are subject to detailed regulation by a government that is very solicitous of their occupants. A French employer must pay his workers well and provide generous benefits, 
and it is almost as hard to fire those workers as it is to evict a New York tenant. So a tenant meaning someone who rents an apartment in New York City. New York's pro-tenant policies have produced very good deals for some people, but they have also made it very hard for newcomers to find a place to live. France's policies have produced nice work if you can get it, but many people, especially the young, can't get it. And given the generosity of unemployment benefits, many don't even try. Okay, so there he's repeating the logic here. Let me just skip ahead here. Um, he says, uh, da, 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 da. now he, he talked about some people's uh, suggested things like a European uh, common market and so forth to fix it. He says, to acknowledge the potential virtues of European economic integration risks missing the essential fatuousness of the whole project. France's problem is unemployment, in parentheses, currently almost 13%. Nothing else is even remotely as important. Okay, so before, notice when I was telling you it's odd that Krugman picks that one statistic when you would think the unemployment rate would be the most relevant just right at the beginning, first cut, how do you assess this? That wasn't me saying that. Krugman himself back in the 1990s when he was diagnosing what causes eurosclerosis, he's obviously price controls, just like rent control in New York City makes it hard to find an, an apartment. In France, you know, it's hard to get rid of a worker and there's generous benefits that you're mandated to give. So of course it's hard for youth to get, to get it. And he said the problem is unemployment, nothing else is remotely as important. So again, notice here too, in this column, it's not that Tom skipped it in the interest of brevity, Nowhere does Krugman say why price controls were bad in the 1990s and that stopped being a problem since then. All he did was point to some empirical measures. He didn't explain why the logic, so for example, is rent control still a problem? Or now, you know, our basic microeconomics been repealed? He doesn't tell us, but again, back in the 1990s, Krugman thought, yeah, you put a price control in place, there's gonna be a glut or a shortage. What do you think's gonna happen? All right, let, I want to move on to this, uh, this one. Europe suffers from persistent weakness in demand because key players, Germany in particular, have an obsessive fear of deficits, even when the European economy desperately needs stimulus. And then he goes on to say that the problem is that politicians have been unwilling to be Keynesian enough. Now on that, that always, in the United States, we have the same problem. That we're, it's never that there's something wrong with the whole Keynesian approach, never. It's always we haven't done enough of it. And Bob's analogy has sometimes been, if you were giving a particular medicine to a group of patients, and every single time you gave that medicine, the, the patient died. Now, it's possible that the dosage was wrong, but your, but your first instinct, your initial instinct, would not be, we just didn't give them enough. Like, that would not be. You think maybe there's something wrong with the thing. So with this topic, there are two ways to approach it. Now, a lot of times we, in the Austrian tradition, we want to first make sure we have the theory right. So we want to understand what is wrong with the economy, what went wrong with the economy, such that we would have people like Krugman saying it needs stimulus. When he says it, mean, it needs stimulus, that means there's something wrong with it. And so we want to know what went wrong with it. And I distinctly recall Krugman in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008 saying that he was tired of all these people trying to understand what had caused the problem because we needed more people trying to figure out what the way out of the issue is. But there's a connection between what caused the problem and how you solve it. And that is at the very heart of the Austrian analysis. You can't separate these things. How you solve it has intimately to do with what you think went wrong in the first place. And so when we look at a devastated economy like the one in 2008, we want to know what got it in that position. And so naturally we have the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And we look at what is it that in that artificial boom really happened. And as we explain, as, as most people in this room no doubt know, there is a misallocation of resources, that resources are misdirected into inappropriate lines of production that are unsustainable, that wouldn't have been initiated if people had been operating on the basis of, of, of unmanipulated interest rates, let's say. So what we're facing then in the recession is the discovery of these errors. We have to sh now shuffle resources back into lines where they can sustainably uh, be placed. Well, how does fiscal, I mean, monetary stimulus obviously does not solve that problem because it just adds more white noise into entrepreneurial calculation. 
Th that doesn't solve the problem. It's just more of what caused the problem. But th then we also have fiscal stimulus, where the government could borrow some money and, and build bridges. But again, is the problem that we don't have enough bridges? Is that the problem? The problem is that we have a lot of resources that are not where they belong. And if the government just arbitrarily, it just comes up with these politically, economically arbitrary projects that are politically determined, is that going to help us make sure that resources go where they sustainably can, can rest, or where they really belong? No, it just shuffles them into more arbitrary lines. So we have this theoretical opposition to the, the, the twin forms of stimulus, but then we could approach it the way a lot of people prefer to see it approached, which is through empirical examination, right? We can say, well, how have these sorts of approach, approaches worked? And this is not the preferable a way to, to look at it for a number of reasons, but it satisfies a lot of people. If you can say, look, they tried fiscal stimulus and here's what happened. And in the case of the US, it so happens that when you try to find real examples of fiscal stimulus lifting the economy out of a rut, it's very hard to find that. So what you actually find, as Bob has pointed out, is that the proponents of fiscal stimulus are reduced to saying, okay, sure, fiscal stimulus didn't solve the Great Depression, but it would have been a lot worse without it. Well, that's a contrary to fact speculation. And then th this, we can find uh, one or two other examples of this. But yet we can actually find the reverse. So uh, Bob has actually written, by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug this right now. Bob actually has a book called Contra Krugman, and the subtitle, can I tell him who came up with the subtitle? Go ahead. The subtitle has Woods written all over it. <laughs> the subtitle is Smashing the Errors of America's Most Famous Keynesian, okay? And in that book, you've got every topic under the sun with all the empirical evidence you could possibly ask for and all the theory that you crave as an Austrian all under one cover. So contrakrugmanbook.com is where you should go. You'll be very, very deeply and profoundly satisfied by that. But do you want to uh, maybe say something on this this line about fiscal stimulus? And yeah, sure. So let me, yeah, let me, well, we'll do it in this narrow case first and then just broaden it to the, the general principle here. So again, Krugman is saying, the, the, you know, yes, there's problems with Europe. He even goes so far as to say, I wouldn't be surprised if Europe is the epicenter of the next global crisis. So Krugman's very smart here, he, you know, he's very strategic. So now, no matter what happens, he was right, right? If Europe does very well, he's gonna say, I told you we should stop complaining about eurosclerosis, as I wrote in my textbook that came out last decade, right? He, he could say that if Europe crashes and has the next Great Depression, he can say, well, I told you that might happen. It's just now he's covering himself and saying, if, if they do have a global crisis, it's not gonna be because of their generous unemployment benefits and so on. It's gonna be because, ah, oh, those Germans, they're so fiscally austere. You know, if it, if it just weren't for them, if they would just be willing to run bigger budget deficits, and if the um, European Central Bank would be willing to cut interest rates more, to, to flood the market with more liquidity, that would have solved the problem. It's because of these right-wingers, that's the problem. And so, you know, again, notice there that he's, no matter what happens, he's gonna claim vindication. But you say, okay, if what you're saying is the reason, for example, that France is still having some trouble, it's not because of French policies, but because of this general, uh, what he calls austerity, for coming from the Germans primarily, then you would expect the, the worst place would be Germany, right? You would think they would be the ones that would have really high unemployment, and maybe that would offshoot a little bit and tr trickle over to France somehow and hurt them too because of the German you know, pig-headedness. But no, as I showed you before, the German economy, their labor market at least, is way better than the French one. So it's odd that it's Germany causing all these problems for France and yet the German economy. So as Tom was saying, if you had to guess, if, even if you weren't guided by theory and was just saying, oh, the Germans are doing the wrong thing, the French are doing the right thing, wouldn't you expect the German economy to be a lot worse than the French, and yet you see the other way around. So that's one thing. And then as Tom says also, just more historically, there are plenty of examples of countries where they, their debts, the government debt to GDP was getting too, were, you know, getting too high, it was getting alarming, and the countries engaged in what has been called austerity. And in some cases, they legitimately cut spending, you know, not just cut the rate of growth, but actually cut it. And in those countries, there's plenty of success stories that have been documented. Canada did it, there were several countries in Europe that did it, I think Ireland did it, where you can see they drastically reduced their government debt to GDP ratio, even in times when the economy was weak and nothing bad happened, right? Their exports went up and so their interest rates fell and so on. 
And so Krugman, in one column, had to go through and explain away all those cases. And he did it the way I said. He said, oh, well, the reason that country got away with it was because their currency went down and their exports went up. Or, yeah, their interest rates went down. But none of those counted. And as Tom said, when you ask them, okay, so you're explaining away all the examples of where austerity worked, you explain them all away and say they were extenuating. Okay, you show me examples of when big deficit pump priming worked. And they truly can't give a single example. They, as Tom said, they might say something like, oh, well, the United States, you know, the, the Obama stimulus package, but no, the economy got worse, and the Keynesian response was to say it would have been worse even still. So there's no time when you can point to this medicine being applied and the economy got better. Even World War II is often considered to be the great example, and believe it or not, Krugman has taken that away. And the, and the reason is because Robert Barrow went through and he looked at to say, the cane, you know, what, what's the multiplier effect if you look at government budget deficits and so on, and it was very low. And so Krugman then said, oh, well, the way, he expl the way Krugman explained that Barrow's result was to say, well, there was wartime rationing. In other words, the private sector wasn't allowed to consume more. Yes, the big government deficits of World War II in the U.S. would have led to a huge expansion in private sector GDP, but it was literally illegal because of rationing. So again, another case where the Keynesians are assuring us the data would fit our predictions if there wasn't something stopping it, right? But there's not a single example where they can point to the country was in trouble, there was huge deficit spending, and then the country got objectively better. It's always, we think we, we arrested the slide and it would have been much worse. In the cases where there's fiscal austerity and the economy does fine, they always say, oh, well, you know, the, the, I guess the economy wasn't in such trouble after all. So it's, as Tom said, in any one or two examples, you could just say, ah, but if consistently over time, it's always one way and not the other, it starts making you think maybe letting politicians borrow and spend money doesn't help the economy. I know it's crazy, but maybe, maybe not. For folks who don't listen to the Contra Krugman podcast, a lot of times at the end of the episode as we're wrapping up, I'll say, uh, all right, Bob, I think we're all finished. And, and Bob will say, can I just say two more things? And yeah, sure, of course, you know, it's our show. But I had a friend uh, in my, one of my, in my private Facebook group say, wouldn't it be fun if someday Bob, uh, Bob said, can I just say two more things? And Tom just said, no, and the closing music comes on. <laughs> and we did that last time, episode 210. Can I just say two more things? I just said, no, and then the music came in. That was the end of the episode. So. Um, <laughs> Do you have two more things you want to say? or we I have one more thing. Can I allow right. it? One, one more thing. Yeah, I'm right, afraid. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so just w quickly on the, the life expectancy thing. So it, it's hard for us to summarize it here because it's a visual aid. But Krugman in his column, when he brings up the life expectancy point, he has a link to Krugman on Twitter, and he has a, a diagram. And so it, you know, I can't... But it starts out early on, like in the 1980s, where French life expectancy in the United States were comparable. And then over time... You know, so this is the French one. It rises more. They're, they're both going up, but the French one goes up more rapidly. And then at some point, the U.S. flattens out and actually goes down a little bit. And so now the get, you know, as of this point now, the gap between them is the largest it's been, you know, since this this, this chart began. And so you know, that's fine. Again, I I don't want to come off as saying oh, I don't care about that because I know markets are right. I think fans of the free market, especially ones working in healthcare policy, should be very diligent and make sure they understand you know what's driving that and let's make sure there's not some flaw in our logic but, and we and I've talked about some of the possible explanations for why that gap could have, could have arisen but what's interesting is even on Krugman's own terms the US chart again the life expectancy goes like this and then it actually starts going down which is unprecedented like why would it and when it starts going down is right in the late 2000s like 2009 2010 and so what happened there? So I think what Krugman's story would be is, oh, that was when the Great Recession really hit. And because in the US we had this crazy system where poor people aren't guaranteed to health care, that's where you saw it you know, kick in. But also another big change that happened then was the introduction of the Affordable Care Act, what's called Obamacare, colloquially. And so you know, it, that, that's just a one-off test. You can't prove it. But I'm saying, suppose in 2010, life expectancy in the US went like that. I'm quite sure Krugman would have said, see, that was the benefit of Obamacare. But the fact that it went like this, you know, should give him pause at least, and yet he didn't even mention that at all. He just think that, that graph is prima facie evidence that not having government provided health insurance or guaranteed health insurance is, is a bad thing. And lastly on that too, let me just mention, we had, remember we had Orrin Cass yeah, on the program? Yeah, that's great. 
because the way U.S. politics works, the, with the expansion of the Affordable Care Act, what partly what they did was they expanded what's called Medicaid, which is the program in the United States that provides where the federal government covers the health care expenses for pe for people who are poor. And so, whereas Medicare is the one for people who are, who are retired, the elderly. And so, so Medicaid is means tested. And the, the way, just to summarize very quickly, the way it works is that U.S. states shoulder or they share some of the, the burden of that. And so the way the legislation passed, it gave U.S. states the option that the federal government would help them for like the first two or three years, I believe, to expand Medicaid. But then from that point forward, the, the, the individual state would be responsible for the extra funding. And so, and it was, it was political too, as you can imagine. So some of the states that were run by Republicans rejected you know, the free money coming from Washington, D.C., and they didn't expand Medicaid, even though they could have under uh, the Affordable Care Act's provisions. And so Warren Cass, who's a, a, a researcher in the United States, once the numbers came in and we had some data, he looked at it, and believe it or not, it turned out that the states, so in this period, U.S. life expectancy was dropping. You know, opioid overdoses were higher, and so there were all these people, people were speculating what's causing this. And so it was interesting to see that the states that expanded Medicaid through the Affordable Care Act saw a bigger drop in life expectancy than the states that rejected the federal money. Okay, so I'm not saying federal money kills you. I mean, it might, you know, and it's, it's certainly if you're in the middle, middle East, it might. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> what, but what I'm saying is that, again, with all this stuff, what would the data have to look like for someone like Paul Krugman to say, huh, maybe I'm wrong here? Where, you know, the, so it's, it's almost like a controlled experiment that the states that reject, you know, said it happened the same time period. It's, it, it's, it can't just be, oh, it's because of the Great Recession. Well, because the Great Recession happened for all 50 states. And so why is it that the states that took the federal money and expanded Medicaid had a drop? And, you know, some, some doctors I know that are fans of the free market say, oh, it's because just the government spending more money doesn't make there be more nurses and doctors. So now you're diluting the medical care among a bigger, so maybe that's why the quality of care went down. You know, there's things like that you could say too. So I, I will stop there. All right, so on the show notes page when this episode is published, uh, ContraKrugman.com slash 211, we'll link to that episode because that was a particularly good one. We have some other resources related to the topic we covered today. And with that, we will, we're, we're going to cease the recording, and then we'll take a few questions. So we're wrapping up the episode. Thanks to everybody for listening. Thank you very much. Well, we have 10 minutes for questions. Veronique first. Let's make the question quickly so we, we use. It could have been 15, but Bob's last thing took a long Thanks, time. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It was great to see this live. I mean, I love listening to it without seeing you, but um, I was actually <laughs> <laughs> two. I also. You prefer hearing but it was so great, seeing It us? was yeah. great seeing you. It was absolutely great seeing you. Thank so, you. I was thinking of something when you were talking about unemployment rate, and one of the things that I've seen our friends on the left starting to do a lot when they wanted to move away from this conversation about unemployment rate is to actually talk about the drop in labor force participation in the U.S. And, uh, and that's another case where it's actually quite fascinating because they're absolutely unwilling. So they'll say, oh, labor force participation for prime age male in particular has been dropping in the U.S. way faster than in European countries or in, even when you take particular countries like France and Sweden. But they are actually not looking at the hour worked, for instance, and actually trying to think in, that in the US we work way more, way more hours because we don't have any restriction on the, on the number of hours that we work, while in France and Sweden, I mean, there's a lot of, plus, uh, you know, marginal tax rates are so much higher. And the other thing is like looking at the drop in unemployment uh, uh, in the labor force participation in the U.S. When you actually look at who dropped the labor, who dropped, it's actually over 50% are people who are claiming disability insurance. Right? So a lot of the things that these guys praise or even use when they shift the conversation mm -hmm. fail to acknowledge that these are not demand, labor demand problems in the US, their supply, and their supply problem created by government intervention. And so how, it would be great if you could go and document all these shift, I mean, I know you're already doing this, but like all the shift 
in, it's kind of like fighting, you know, the mushroom thing where you right. press on one and, and it pops. And, and what do you think are like the biggest shift in Krugman rhetoric that can be explained by basically him shifting data because we had made a case strong enough that the data he was, use, he, he was using before just suck. Right. Um, okay, so if I understand, so she, she was talking about the, the depending on the, the argument, the labor participation rate in the United States could be used one way or the other. And so she was saying, okay, but even if you're going to try to use that, we as like libertarian supply side focused economists can show why government policy might have caused that. And then I think you were asking me, can I, can I give a good example of when Krugman just totally switches? So another one is what this has to do with what's called potential GDP. I'll be really quick, Federico, don't worry. Uh, potential GDP. <laughs> so early on, um, the, 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 the Keynesian response, because Austrians and also some real business cycle theory people were saying, well, no, the problem with the housing boom, it, it was a real problem. There was misallocation. Too many resources went into housing, and so now we need to have the pain of the recession to get workers out of housing and elsewhere where, the, where they belong. And so the way the Keynesians answered that was they said, no, potential GDP is still growing just fine. And you know, the, so the, the economy's potential is still the capacity, it's just the workers need to, to show up, they need to have demand. So th at that point, it was the fact that potential GDP was still growing, and there was this huge gap between potential GDP and actual GDP showing this is an aggregate demand problem. You know, you structuralists, you real business cycle theory are wrong. Then later, when a paper came out showing how potential, the gap between potential GDP and real GDP was actually gone, because there, there would be some signals you would see according to a, you know, a, a mainstream neoclassical framework, and those signals weren't there, so pe new papers were coming out a few years down the road saying, no, there is no gap between potential and actual, and so the, the way Krugman explained that was he said, wow, potential GDP has been growing much more slowly because of you know, the austerity policies, look at how devastating austerity has been. Now our long-term potential is way lower than otherwise would have been. And so that's why we need to have bigger government deficit spending. Okay, so no matter whether the potential GDP was above or at actual, both cases proved why we need to have government deficits mm -hmm. in Krugman's mind. So I, th I mean, it was just, there, I mean, it was, a, it was a, I think, a contradiction with a C that he just said the one way proved one thing, or you know, no matter what, it proved that we need bigger government deficits. Uh, let me just say a quick thing. Uh, Veronique, when I saw that you were sitting in front, I actually said to Bob, if, if, if we draw a blank on anything, we can always ask Veronique to bail us out. Um, and also, just a quick thing, when this is done, um, just for a, f a short period of time, I have to barrel on out of here, but then I'll be back and I can talk to people after that, but I hope you won't think me rude. Okay, I am going to be rude, but I'm, try I'm just letting you know in advance that I'm, go I'm going to be rude. <laughs> Good morning. I want to thank you very much for a delightful conversation and a very good job of refuting different points that were raised uh, by Mr. Krugman. Uh, it uh, was poignantly done and with a lot of thought and uh, good intention. Um, as I heard you say, I believe and agree with you that you are correct. He says jargon. You are correct. He says misinformation in the misutilization of statistics. And again, you are correct. He leads us all to incorrect conclusions. These are simply tools of rhetoric, classic. In my experience, it is much easier to edit than it is to create. After 211 programs, it appears to me that perhaps with all the tools you've developed and skills and proper mic utilization, maybe we're at a point where we can create ourselves. Now, I realize this is an organic process. I realize that you've done this off the... You, the question is this, what, what is holding you back from being a leader as opposed to editing in the wake of his statements? Do you want to... Well, um, Bob and I each have our own programs that we do where we don't let anybody set the agenda for us. So I, I have over 1,500 episodes of that. But I do all kinds of public speaking. I do YouTube videos. I have a, an online teaching uh, academy called libertyclassroom.com where 
people can learn real history and economics and philosophy from the comfort of their homes. I helped to create the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum to educate children from kindergarten through 12th grade. Those are the things I'm doing. We, we should give this guy a Lifetime Achievement Award, huh? <laughs> <laughs> The point is we do the Krugman thing because it's fun for us because yeah. be, because he has a big audience. He's never lived in a world before where the technology exists for somebody to refute him week after week. And sometimes it's fun. I mean, yes, it, 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 it's also fun to build economics step by step. And Bob has done plenty of that in his teaching and his courses and his books. But another way of teaching it is by showing co common, popular ways that people hear at the water cooler at work where people go wrong. Because Krugman goes wrong a lot of times in the way a lot of average people go wrong. And now he has a much more sophisticated way of going wrong, but he reaches the same wrong conclusion. And it's, it's useful, because sometimes if you just build things up for people, they won't always see what the fallacy is in an error. If you, unless you expressly teach, here's the error being committed, and here is the light of truth to respond to it. I think there's room for both. Yeah, real quickly. So, I, if what you're, if one way of, of or paraphrasing your concern, if you're saying, aren't you guys just always responding to him? You're letting him set the agenda. That actually was my initial response when Tom first proposed that we do this podcast. My initial thought was. Nah, because we're always going to be, we're going to be, I don't want to be known as the economist that, that doesn't like Krugman, okay? That I want to, you know, I want to be my own person or whatever. I want to be the economist that, like, follows Tom Woods around or something like that, you know? And, um, and, and so, but Tom convinced, he said, no, I mean, Krugman's got a Nobel Prize. He has a perch in the New York Times. So he's a very prominent person. And, and so, yeah, in a certain sense, Krugman's irrelevant. But also, he's, he's setting the stage, and he comments that he has a huge audience. And he, I mean, his blog was you know, ranked number one, at least the last time I saw, in terms of economics blogs. So it's not that we're picking on a straw man or something here. And also, lastly, Krugman actually is a very eloquent, uh, a very clear writer. right? So you know exactly what Krugman means, and when he picks analogies to motivate his, his Keynesian principles, it's a good analogy. Like, it, it's a very concrete thing. In contrast, Thomas Piketty is not like that. Piketty, when you criticize him, his standard response is to say, oh no, that's not what I meant, you misunderstood me. Whereas Krugman will say, that's right, if aliens attacked, it would be great, you know? So he, 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 he's not afraid to look crazy to you know, exaggerate the example to get the point across. So he's a good foil. All right, and thanks for taking my question. Um, I know no one's a mind reader, but it's truly mystifying when you point out these examples like Krugman not just taking the unemployment rate. What, if you were a betting man, what do you think motivates Krugman? Is he full of cognitive dissonance? Is he wicked or is he just like a true believer and will uh, say whatever will further the cause even, or is it something else? What do you think? I don't know. I would rather just listen to you talk for another two minutes. Your accent's awesome. But uh, uh, <laughs> I want to go watch Rob Roy McGregor. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I think you can see an evolution in Krugman's columns, okay, that uh, again, in the 1990s, he was a good economist. Like that stuff with eurosclerosis, when he opposed rent control, when he, he did lots of things he talked about in the 90s. Uh, he was very, very good on free trade and protectionism back in the 90s. And then over time, he just got more political and it's not just that he's political, but nowadays, a lot of times I'll say to Tom, for those of you listening to the show, you wouldn't even know that this was an economist writing this. That's how he's not even trying to like fit it into a model and come up with something. So I, my quick answer is, I mean, he won the Nobel Prize. He's got a lot of money. His, his textbooks sell. I mean, Krugman's, I believe, a millionaire, or at least if he hasn't been squandering his money, he's got to be a millionaire. And so I think at this point, he's seen, I can say outrageous stuff, nothing bad happens to me. And so, you know, incentives, I think, I think he's just gotten lazy and, and doesn't care anymore. Yeah, and there are definitely columns today he would never have written, uh, columns from the 1990s he would never have written. He, oh, he yeah. wouldn't write that sweatshop column. Right? Oh, not at all. That. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, no, sorry, I'm sorry. Here I am. I'm, like, I'm in charge of the thing. Sorry. That's what just Rahim, the, the, la the last one, and before Rahim asks the question, this will be the last one, but, you know, Bob will be here. We can have lunch with him, continue talking to him. And please, let's start. We have to finish the conference literally at four. So 
Please, let's start. We have three parallel sessions amazing after, the, after lunch, and then, you know, Veronique's that, you know, with a lecture with, that will be closing the conference. Let's do everything on time, and also so we have uh, time to ask questions for Veronique. So, very short, Rahim, and then we, we finish. Thanks a lot. Uh, US socialists and Keynesians, of course, love to present Europe in the best possible light. But I wonder if by comparing, based on empirical data, Europe and the US, you're already falling into the trap of Krugman. Uh, because, of course, Europe is a continent and not a nation, despite the EU technocrats. Uh, uh, some uh, parts of Europe share the same monetary policy, but the effects are totally different according to economic policy policy and cultural differences, which I think are underestimated by economists usually, in particular Krugman. Uh, and if we are looking at the monetary policy, don't you think that the production structure in the United States is already more highly distorted than the European countries? Does any comparison uh, of uh, economic policies and outcome uh, is, is useless, in hmm. a sense? Do you want to take that? I kind of miss. Can you say something? Well, uh, I don't know. You want to get clarification there? If the more production time. structure is already more highly distorted in the United States, uh, would you agree with that? And would you conclude that it's very hard to follow Krugman in comparing economic policies? I, I mean, certainly th there's a, a danger in just d doing raw, crude comparisons. And I think what happens is typically the, the analyst who already knows what he wants the answer to be can keep looking and find some statistic that, that shows, I see I'm right. You know, so you can do something like that. Um, it, it, it would be tricky. I guess I would want to look more closely. Um, earlier on, it seemed like the Federal Reserve, yes, was to me was 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 looser and had a more expansionary, distortionary policy. But I don't know that. I mean, there were never negative interest rates in the United States, you know. So there, you know, that's that's an example. So I'm not saying I disagree with you, but I, I personally would want to go research more before I gave my thought on that particular question. Fair enough. Okay. okay. All right, we're much. done. All right, thank you. Okay, I'll see you a little later. Okay.